It's my pleasure to introduce Craig Israelite, uh, who uh, is uh, really a spectacular uh, adult reconstructive surgeon. Uh, he does our hip and knee joint replacements along with our colleagues John Garino and Guo Li. Uh, we have uh, recently added uh, Eric Hume uh, to our faculty, and uh, all of these gentlemen are go-to men for different things. But Craig really uh, has been in this business a long time. He thinks a lot about it. He's an incredibly dedicated individual to pen orthopedics, but really to surgery and has the um, distinction, really, of being the residency program coordinator. Uh, so he is the, uh, the uh, if you will, the idol or the uh, best example of uh, faculty we have for our residents. All, all our faculty is great and they love teaching, but Craig has the distinction of being the residency program director. The residents respect him enormously, as do the rest, rest of our faculty. He's going to talk to you about um, osteoarthritis in the hip and knee and joint replacement. So Craig, glad to have you. Thanks. Uh, again, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, as, as resident director, one of the things I do is monitor the 80-hour uh, work week, which uh, I'm sure none of you know, never, ne never learned that. Uh, we actually spend more time than our residents working. So particularly on a Saturday morning, uh, I, I thank you all for coming because it is tough. Secondly, I, I would like to also emphasize that this has been an outstanding orthopedic uh, program for a long time. This is the oldest orthopedic surgery program in the country, and Dr. Levin mentioned that we want to go from good to great, and you know, we, I think we have the best program for sure in the region, with the uh, best outcomes, et cetera, but unless we get that out there and speak with you and you have access uh, to the system, it's very difficult, and so I would also um, reiterate that we are all accessible. There's this myth that it's hard to get. Actually, it's not a myth. It's actually been true, but we need to change that. And so, unfortunately, when I loaded it back onto this different background for today's talk, I usually put my email there. But I would encourage you to take your pen and write my name, which is Craig.Israelite at uphs.upenn.edu. So that's my email, and that's how I've at least for about a year and a half since I got my Crackberry, you know, communicate with you all because it's hard to go through sometimes phone trees and, and you want to have an answer. So I don't encourage you to email me any time. And I spend, you know, lots of time. The only time I can't do it now is my kids don't like it when I drive. But <laughs> other than that, I will get back to you that day. You don't have to put up with the secretarial or phone trees, which we are making better. But if you email, I'm sure any of us, about a patient, a patient that you're not even going to refer to us, it takes two seconds for me to say I, I would get a CAT scan, I'd get an MRI. So, so I'd write down all our names. I'm, I'm speaking for everyone else, but I'm sure they would have the same thing. Uh, some people get phones out, but my phone actually doesn't work a lot because you know I have lead on sometimes and it just doesn't ring. So if you email me, I would say it'd be very difficult for me not to answer you within you know that day. So I would encourage that. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about osteoarthritis of the hip and knee. I'm going to start with the knee and then go on to the hip. Uh, and it's very important. There's over 40 million Americans uh, who have osteoarthritis. So it's very, very common. And it's not as sexy as some of the other topics, and, and, and we don't get all the funding. But, but it is, and there's lots of studies that support this, up to a third of complaints to uh, primary care physicians You know, when they talk about their list of complaints. So it's very important. The other thing you should know, particularly about the hip and knee, in the United States last year, there were over 700,000 knee replacements. So it is, it is a huge uh, part of our health system. And the other part of that is, uh, unlike when I was a resident where we would just say, wait till you're 65 and then come back, almost 40% of all the hip replacements, I mean knee replacements in the United States last year were in patients under the age of 60. So there's an increasing burden on the health care. So we're going to all have to work together because there are going to be constraints with our new health system, and not everyone's going to get a knee replacement because the numbers, uh, projected numbers by 2015, are off, off the charts. And so most of my family is Canadian, and, and they actually have limits on how many knee replacements or hip replacements those hospitals can do. So we're going to also all have to work together to see who's really going to benefit, when to benefit them, and what to do. Hip replacements also, about half the number. So we're talking over a million replacements, so it's very important. So I'm going to just go briefly, and, 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 and it's just a generic uh, talk because it, it's hard to, to talk about hip and knee replacements in a half an hour uh, without 
my usual slides of too many too many citations. So, but what but what is it? You know, what is it? It's not it's not inflam it's not an, an itis like you think of like hepatitis, carditis, or any of those. It's osteoarthritis, and, and there's different causes. And it's either idiopathic, which means we don't know which is the, the predominant amount. It's either infectious, post-traumatic, congenital abnormalities, uh, or avascular necrosis. So one of the you know little caveats always try and put out little things like in this area, someone has hip or knee pain, and one of the questions always to ask: drinking history and steroid history. So we practice in the land of prednisone, you know, for asthma, lots of dose packs out there. So we see, particularly at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of avascular necrosis. So that's one of the two, two questions. You always want to take a drinking history and, and um, a steroid history. But what is osteoarthritis? Like I said, it's not an inflammatory process as, as we just study most of our organ systems. Essentially what you have is abnormal processes which um, go down microfracture, stiffness, cartilage degradation, chondrocyte enzymes destroy the matrix. But essentially what it is, is we're destroying more of the cartilage than we're able to repair, and that's what osteoarthritis is. And so this little diagrammatic shows it. So when the patients come in the office, there's a little diagram of a normal knee and an arthritic knee, and that's essentially the difference. That's what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you want to tell them in the office, you know, what, what is it? Well, all your joints, so wherever you bend, your finger joint, your wrist joint, your knee joint, wherever you bend, that's a joint. And the joints obviously are covered with this articular cartilage and tell them they see it every day. You know, you look at a drumstick, on the end of the drumstick, that white shiny stuff on the end of the drumstick, it's nice and smooth. It's smooth so that your joints glide. If that is no longer smooth and it gets roughened, it's like taking a bowling ball. You can go down, roll a bowling ball down the bowling lane, nice and smooth. You put a cracker chip in it, it bounces around, and that's all we're talking about. So it's the degradation, and it's a good analogy that the patients like to understand. They don't like to be told, well, you're old, that's why you have arthritis. You have to give them a biological reason for what's going on, okay? And so what do you do then? You take, you know, slide. I have this slide in almost every one of my talks. You have to still do a history and physical examination. And osteoarthritis is pretty simple. I mean, n you know, 90% of the diagnoses people tell you in medicine you can make by just the history. Well, we're, we're probably 99%. So that's why I went into it. I would, my internal medicine people, when I was in medical school, I thought they were so smart. I was like, I could never be that smart. That, so I went into something where there's like 208 bones. I could get my hand around something. <laughs> you know, evolution isn't going around. But, but it's true. These guys had memorized, uh, I forget the textbook, Cecil, whatever, Harrison's, whatever. And I was like, I can't do this. So orthopedics was where I went. So it's quite honest. That, that's actually true. Uh, and x-rays. Get an x-ray. It's one of the only tests we have now that's actually pretty cheap. So to get a knee or hip x-ray is about 80 bucks. So, so I would encourage you to get an x-ray uh, on all your patients. You wouldn't send someone to a cardiologist on your own for chest pain without an EKG, but I would get an x-ray as a baseline study and you'll be able to determine it. And we're gonna talk about what x-rays to get. So, and then you think, again, principle of parsimony, Occam's rays, whatever you wanna call it, simple, simple, simple. What can cause pain? And in orthopedics, it's kinda simple. It's either from the bone, from the tendons, from the ligaments, from the cartilage, but you also have to remember the referred pain. So this is kind of easy. You just think and you go along and you remember your anatomy, how to figure out, is it from the knee, is it from the hip, whatever. But referred pain you have to re understand too because I get lots of x-rays. People get sent in with a hip, knee, and ankle x-ray, and I say, well, where's your problem? Well, I get the shooting pain all the way down my leg, and it's from their back. So you have to remember, particularly for the hip and knee, you know, the L3 nerve root, whatever, the low back pain can cause that pain. And also, hip pain radiates to the knee. So if someone has knee pain, they have normal knee x-rays, if you examine their hip and knee, just don't focus in on that one joint. There's a lot of referred pain that goes on. And so you look at their clinical symptoms and don't put words in their mouth. These are the key words to discern if it's referred pain or pain in the knee. And I'm gonna start with the knee and then fold with the hips. So that's the way we're gonna divide this because my chairman only lets me do two joints. So we're not gonna do ankle or shoulder, we're just doing hip and knee. So in the knee, what do you have in all your joints? Pain, swelling, locking, catching, loss of motion. Those are the words that you want them to tell you. If it's like, well, it, you know, it just kind of aches or it shoots down, when they start using those type of words, start to think elsewhere. So those are the key ones you wanna do and it'll make it easy and then you take them and it's hard to examine people in shorts, I mean, in, in long pants. You have to put them in a gown, or now we have these disposable shorts. Y you really need to do that, because you can just, from observation, see what's going on. So this patient here has a varus deformity or knock need. 
or, or, or bow-leggedness, or compared to valgus, which is knockney. So look at the alignment. That'll cue you in. So if you looked at this patient, you would say, well, he's pretty bow-legged. He's going to have some symptoms on the inside of his knee. So just from the physical examination, and you also want to see if there's the presence of fluid. So the knee's kind of easy, particularly e even in, in, in heavier individuals. What you do is you stroke the one side, and it's called a blotment test. You'll be able to see it puff out on that medial aspect, and you want to document if there's fluid because that also will eliminate some of the referred type pain. And, you know, the joke is someone comes in with leg pain, you know, what do they get, you know, as their treatment? Well, if they see a spine surgeon, they get their disc out. If they see a vascular surgeon, they get a fem pop. You know, if they see an orthopedic surgeon like me, they get a total knee replacement. So is everybody wrong? The answer is no. Everyone has more than one thing going on with them. We, al we always want one patient, one disease, but we have lots of things that overlap. But it's very easy to figure out if something is from the knee as opposed to be referred pain just by the way they, they stand, by the way they walk, and the presence of fluid. So then what do you do? This is one of the hardest parts when I talks when I give to medical residents, uh, you know, and, and even internists out in the community, that people don't like to aspirate the knee. It's a, it's a technique which is really simple, which I would encourage all of you to do. I'll get lots of evaluation and treatment referrals where it'll say tap knee. But I would encourage everybody to do this technique because it's very simple, and it gives you the diagnosis right before they leave the office. And so what you do is you, you know, you... you sterilize them and you aspirate their knee and you look at the, the fluid that comes out. So if it's clear yellow, which is most of the time in osteoarthritis, you can read the numbers through the syringe. It's osteoarthritis. You leave the needle in, you can give them a cortisone injection and you've treated them. They feel happy. You've decompressed the joint. You gave them a cortisone injection. If you can't read the numbers through them, that means there's more inflammatory um, stuff going on in there. You send it for, you know, a gram sitting culture and also a cell count. It's also very important for us. So that's what you would do with them, and you wouldn't inject in those people, but you add it for additional diagnosis. But if it's bloody, that's changed the ballgame. Those are the patients where you say, I want you to be seen tomorrow, you know, or here's some crutches, get off, because then, you know, you've torn something. And if you see bloody and some fat globules in it, then for sure you have to make that patient non-weight bearing. So even if they have normal x-rays, Remember, an x-ray is just a photograph. You know, how many fingers do I have up? I have two fingers. How many do I have up now? I still have two fingers, but you can't see that on a normal x-ray. So if someone has some fat and when you pull it out, you keep them non-weight bearing because what happens sometimes is, you know, they come in to see us three or four weeks later and that non-displaced fracture can displace and they change the whole treatment paradigm. So I would encourage you to aspirate and even inject in the office. Radiographic analysis said you should get x-rays. So what kind of x-rays do you get? Well, the standard in, in our office, and, and, and what I would encourage you to do is get an AP weight-bearing x-ray, not laying down, standing on it, because it will show us what's going on, a lateral and what's called a merchant view or a patellofemoral view. So it's really three different x-rays you should use as your standard ordering, AP weight-bearing, lateral, patellofemoral, or a merchant view. And the reason is, this is the same, uh, it doesn't really show here very well, but there's this joint space here. So this is the femur, this is the tibia, and there's a little joint space between the ends of the bone. That's what articular cartilage looks like. The same patient standing, the joint space narrows down. So if you just took a regular x-ray, which is the standard, if you just write AP x-ray on an x-ray request, they don't stand them. You try and stand them so you can see this, and it's called a Rosenberg view, but just put AP weight bearing x-ray. As far as MRIs. So I authored a study not too long ago where we took 100 consecutive patients that were sent to our office and looked at what studies they had when they came to us from the referring physician and what we, you know, what we gathered from that information. And out of 100 patients who were sent to us, it's over, I think it was like 62 or 63 patients had MRIs already with them. Some people had MRIs and x-rays, like were sent for an x-ray and MRI the same day. Some people just worked for the MRI. Uh, but over 62 or 63, I forget the exact number, had MRIs. The usefulness was zero. Not one of them in the age 60 and over. I'm not talking about 20 or 30 year old individual. I'm talking about, you know, the generic uh, over 55, over 60 year old uh, patient. We didn't use that MRI at all. And it's a minimum $800 test. So again, in the economics that we're all going to be forced to deal with, people 
think that it's the, the proper test to get, you know, as opposed to some of the other, you know, uh, x-rays that we talked about this morning in osteoarthritis of the knee or hip, MRI is not the way to go. It provides little diagnostic and definitely no therapeutic information unless the x-ray is negative. So what I would say is order the x-ray. If the x-ray is negative, then get the MRI. I understand. I fight with patients too. They want the MRI yesterday, but if you explain to them it's not going to change their treatment and it's just a waste economically, waste of your time, and we will get that x-ray, I mean that MRI after the x-ray, that's what I would encourage you to do. And most of the patients are like, okay, that's fine. But to send them for an x-ray and MRI the same day or just the MRI, I would not encourage. However, if the x-ray is normal and they have pain in their knee, then you get the MRI and you can see it. So there's a focal edema here, you know, there's obviously a lesion there, and then I say, so that's why you have your knee pain. Okay? So I wouldn't do it. The other reason of not to order the MRI is they're going to hassle you because all the MRIs, starting at age 30, there are changes and they're going to have a meniscus tear. And so they demand an immediate referral to take care of their meniscus. And I'm going to talk about meniscal surgery in the, in the, in the setting of osteoarthritis. And the menis, you know, so we all have globular single, which is type 1, more extensive edema in 2, and then occasionally there's a full thickness tear in stage 3. They're all going to be red as positive meniscus tears by the MRI because it's a very sensitive test. This is the only one that's going to benefit from treatment, though. So if they don't say on that report that you get back, that it goes to the surface, they probably won't benefit from an arthroscopic debridement, which I'm going to talk about. So, so there's two reasons not to get MRI, particularly in the patients over age 60 that you're thinking of osteoarthritis. Number one, it doesn't provide any information, and number two, it kind of pushes them to, well, I just need an arthroscopy to fix the meniscus tear. So how do you treat everything in life? Well, in my house, we treated benign neglect, but that doesn't work in the office. So you have two ways to treat everything. You either get an operation or you, get an op or, you, know, or you treat it non-surgically. That's it. So people come in, and sometimes they say, well, I don't want an operation, and I point to my sleeve. It says orthopedic surgery. That's kind of what I do. However, that's really not what I do. I'll see a, a lot of patients in a day. Only four or five patients actually get an operation, right? But there's only two ways to treat everything. So I'm going to go through non-operative treatment, which is going to become more and more important as time goes on because the population is getting older. Younger people are having, you know, higher active lifestyles and someone, you can even argue, having some iatrogenic injuries to their knees. Uh, but regardless, the number of people who are having significant osteoarthritis is going up and up and up every year. And so we're going to have to treat a lot more of these patients and we're going to treat them non-operably until they really need the surgery. So what are they? So are there activity modifications? Simple stuff. They play tennis singles. Maybe they can, you can convert them to doubles. They play three times a week maybe twice a week. You want activity modifications, try to get away from the kneeling and the squatting. Weight loss, 10 pound uh, weight loss is significant. Lots of studies to show even a 10 pound weight loss won't help their arthritis, but it will help their pain. So it depends on the patient, but you might be able to quote some studies and tell them that. So you can't say you're fat and that's not what caused your arthritis in particular, but weight loss definitely helps. Anti-inflammatory medicines and analgesics we'll talk about. Assisted devices. You put a cane in the contralateral extremity, and it reduces the joint reaction forces for up to 25 to 30%, so that's significant. So if they like to walk around the track, just give them a walking stick in the other hand. It helps. Um, intraarticular injections, we're going to talk about orthotics and muscle strengthening. Muscle strengthening, again, won't help osteoarthritis per se. It doesn't reverse osteoarthritis, but it gives a general sense of well-being, and their pain scores go down and you're just trying to buy them some time. They also will reduce their fall risk, et cetera. So when you write for physical therapy, you just can't put physical therapy, strength in the right knee. You have to put osteoarthritis, low impact, and you have to actually tell them what we're trying to do, which is muscle balance, range of motion, and strengthening, not sending someone on a treadmill uh, by some physical therapist who wants to make everyone an, you know, an Olympic athlete, and they come back with more pain. As far as medications, you know, NSAIDs and acetaminophen, they're the standard. I mean, everyone takes them. That's your first line of treatment. Narcotics, I have to tell you, we get very prejudiced when we see patients on narcotics when we see them in the office. It, you know, just like everybody else, someone comes in and they're on high dose, you know, they're Percocet or MS Cotton. It's very difficult as a surgeon to look them in the eye and say, I'm going to get you off the antibiotics. So chronic pain, I would encourage you not to provide narcotic. If they're at that stage in your office 
and you want to go above the narcotics or, or maybe some uh, Ultram, I would say that's a good referral point. Try not to get into that narcotic addiction because we don't like the phone calls. I'm sure you, you sure don't like the phone calls that they want Percocet at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Uh, oral corticosteroids, not for osteoarthritis. So the dose packs or whatever, we do not provide those for hip or knee arthritis. And uh, nutritional supplements, that's always the hot topic. You know, it's a huge industry, $26 billion industry. A lot of dollars go in there. But you have to remember that it's not even FDA approved. Some of the, the things that's on the box, not even what's in the jar. So, you know, so is this worthwhile? Well, the only really good prospective randomized controlled study, which is the basis for evidence-based medicine, shows it doesn't really help. You know, there was one little caveat that says maybe a few, you know, patients do, and I'm sure there's patients in this room who take it. And my view of this is, listen, it doesn't hurt you. There's no contraindication, but it is expensive. And so some patients on fixed incomes, it's $20, $25 a month. You know, I, I tell them, take it for two or three months. If it's helping you, great. If it's not helping you, do away with it. But as far as the scientific evidence, doesn't help. As far as injection therapy, again, things that I think everyone should be able to do in their office, two types. There's cortisone injections, which does have grade 1A uh, data to show that it is efficacious. It doesn't cure osteoarthritis. You know, we try and limit them, although there's no real number. Uh, the number is generally we don't like to do them within two, you know, three to four months uh, apart and not more than two or three a year because you know, then they do cause some irritation in some local uh, osteopenia and, and tendon atrophy, but, but two to three a year is fine, and they do provide relief, and there's data to support that. As far as visco supplementation, there's lots of them on the market now. There's Suparts, Orthvis, Synvisc. You know, when I first started, there were five injections, so they had to come back every week uh, for, for five weeks. Now uh, Synvisc 1 is out, so it's one injection. Um, there's some data. It's not a 1A, it's a 2B. So there's some data to show that it does provide relief, but it's moderate relief for moderate osteoarthritis for up to six months. So again, you have to tell the patients, you know, it's not a cure. It's not injecting cartilage. People come in and say they want cartilage injected in their knee. That's not what we're doing. It's really, I tell people it's like a motor oil for your knee. And if they have mild or moderate osteoarthritis, some patients get symptomatic relief for up to six months. Who's the ideal patient? The patient who's a little young, who's got moderate symptoms. You know, I give those, you know, sometimes the, the people go to Florida for four months over, over the Christmas holidays. You know, they just need a little bit to get them going. But once people have osteoarthritis of, of, of greater than moderate uh, degree, it, it really doesn't help very much. So what happens? Eventually, non-surgical treatment uh, fails. And so then you have to get an operation. And so there's some generic procedures that are done. I'm not going to talk about arthrodesis because that just means that we're just basically make, doing away with the joint and kind of gluing the, the knee together. Uh, and then the, the analogy would be if I broke my arm and I moved it around, it hurts. So I put in a cast, it doesn't hurt so much. So we can do that to the knee. We can actually fuse the joint, but it's very rarely used. So I'm going to talk about arthroscopy, osteotomies, partial knee replacement, and then a full knee replacement. So what's arthroscopy? It's the most commonly performed orthopedic procedure in the United States. Why? Well, because it's easy, and there's not too much downside. You just make little portals, and it gives you excellent pictures, and we can evaluate what's inside the knee. Now, uh, I would believe Dr. Kelly's probably going to talk a little bit about in the sports medicine about the meniscus, but prior to 1975, 76, a lot of people thought the meniscus was just like the appendix of the knee. It's just some remnant structure. He didn't need it. I had a senior partner who was sued because he didn't take out the whole meniscus and a guy get a second tear. Well, now we know it has significant functions of bearing, absorption, joint stabilization, and lubrication. So this is, so I'm going to go through some slides, and this is what a normal knee looks like. That's your femur up here. All of them are going to be oriented, femur, tibia, and that meniscus cartilage. So it's like a pad for inside the knee. So what happens, just even in general aging, you start to get a little roughening of the end of it, it gets irritated. Uh, this would show up as a meniscus tear in, in, on an MRI. However, if you took this out, you're probably doing more harm to this gentleman than good because it's just kind of roughened. It's not torn as opposed to here where you're starting to get more you know, wear and tear. And so the analogy I would use in the office is your meniscus is like a rung underneath the door. If you open and close the door and if the, if the, 
if the rug is torn, what happens to the rug? It kind of goes back and forth, back and forth. It's very irritating. People get this catching, locking, recurrent effusions. And so you can go in there and trim that up, and you generally will help them. Where it's really good, and again, our sports medicine colleagues do more of this than I do, you have a normal femur, normal tibia, you can see this tear right in here. So people come in, and that tear actually locks in, and they can't straighten or bend their knee all the way. Obviously, this needs surgical treatment. However, what's done in osteoarthritis, and you try and repair it if you can. So that's another thing that our sports medicine colleagues do because you want to repair the meniscus if you can. What happens, now this is the most common patient I see. They have both things going on. So again, this is the femur, tibia. You see this, there's just no articular cartilage here. This is the meniscus, so they have this tear and they have an articular cartilage defect. So you have to remember the theme of this is arthroscopy is not for osteoarthritis of the knee. Now that's no longer a secret. It's been in the Wall Street Journal, it's been around. Unfortunately, it's done all the time. So again, I think one of the best things about a community outreach program in this is try and steer your patients away from arthroscopy for degenerative conditions. Because I can go in there and get rid of some mechanical symptoms, but I'm not gonna help this at all. Particularly, you know, patients get, you know, there's no cartilage in here. Now I might be able to go up there and get rid of some swelling, but unless I'm going to do a microfracture technique or an autolysis chondrocyte implantation, something significant to put cartilage back on here, the results of their treatment, and you ha all have patients who've had arthroscopy and are worse off three months, six months down the road, and it's because the indications for the surgery were incorrect. And certainly here, this you can tell it's a lateral joint because that's the popliteus. I'm sure you all remember from your anatomy days. There's no cartilage in here. So if I scope this, there's only going to be one person to benefit. And that's me, because we're going to get reimbursed for it, and the patient's not going to do well. And in fact, chondroplasty in the knee for degenerative conditions, patients do worse. They go on to knee replacement more quickly than people who have not had arthroscopy. So I'm not saying that arthroscopy is bad, because I don't want you to think that your orthopedic surgeon that you're using or, or whatever is bad because he's doing all this arthroscopy, but you have to have the right indications, and you want the patients to do well. So when you're talking to your patient or that physician, that orthopedic surgeon that you have a relationship with, if they don't have this, they're not getting better, and they have to have normal alignment. So if they're an extreme valgus or varus, you know, knock knee or bow leg, they're bad, they're not going to get better. They have to have mechanical symptoms. That's what you're treating, the locking, clicking, catching, not the, oh, my whole knee hurts. They take one finger, it's called the one finger sign, as opposed to the one you guys use, one finger sign, they put it right on the inside of their knee or outside, they have to pinpoint where that, that pain is. No osteoarthritic x-rays, you know, signs of uh, osteoarthritis and short duration of symptoms. So more than six months has been shown in the literature to be the cutoff. So under six months, you might be able to get them through. If someone has had two or three years of pain and they're coming in, arthroscopy is not going to help them that very much, at least statistically, and no previous surgery. So a lot of times they get people referred in, they've had five knee arthroscopies, and they say, can you scope my knee? What are the, what's the likelihood of me helping them? So again, we don't want to keep doing it. Moving on to arthritis, though. So this is a patient with weight-bearing views. So non-weight-bearing, weight-bearing, same patient. That's why you get the weight-bearing views. But they only have one area, which is osteoarthritic. What about the other side? You know, that looks pretty normal. Behind the kneecap's normal. So it's like if you knock one tooth out, you don't get a whole bridge. You just fix the one tooth. So more and more, we do partial things. I put this slide in because this was very popular a few years back, and one of the other speakers uh, alluded to it. You don't want to be the first one in. There's a lot of marketing in orthopedics. A lot. It's big business. It's big business for the hospitals. They push orthopedic procedures. But we don't want to do bad things. And so when you see all these billboards out there or, you know, this is a 30-year knee or whatever, you really have to investigate it. I mean, orthopedic surgeons aren't, you know, generally stupid by nature, although we sometimes. Um, if there was a great way to do it, we'd all do it the same, same way. So you have to be careful to be the first one in. So you see a lot of these newer modalities. Don't do harm to your patients or don't have them go down fall, false pathways. But there are some things that we do. One thing's an osteotomy. So if the, the pressure's over here, we don't necessarily have to treat that. Well, let's just put the pressure over here. So what we do is we cut the bone, realign the bone, and actually it unloads the bone and they actually have a good result. Will they have a good result forever? No, but it's a good 
pre-total knee for someone who's a labor active person, you know, 30, 35, they're doing construction, they still want to ski, those type of things. Osteotomies are seldomly used because they're hard to perform and there's a higher risk for the patient, but they're generally still a very good thing. What's more common now with partial knee replacements, because minimally invasive surgery and everything you hear about, we just replace half the knee, you know? So we just go in there and balance the knee and we put this in, okay? And so instead of the bone rubbing on the bone, there's now metal and plastic, but as opposed to that unispacer, which I showed before, this is fixed and actually has very good data. So, and this is what it looks like radiographically. So instead of bone rubbing against the bone, you have this metal and plastic rubbing together, but that doesn't hurt. So that's what a replacement is. So for indications, because everyone wants, you know, it's one of those less is better approaches, but you have to pick the right patients. There's three compartments in the knee, patellofemoral, medial, lateral. If you're only fixing one compartment and the other two compartments are shot, you're not going to get better. But if you have the correct patient selection, you have unicompartmental arthritis, there's not much bone loss, they have good stability, these patients do very well, and so we do partial knee replacements, patellofemoral, unicompartmental, medial, lateral. Sometimes we actually do a two-compartmental now, so we are doing things to try and minimize the duration of recovery and also preserve as much of the natural bone structure as we can. Well, what happens if that doesn't fail, if that fails? Well, if you have disabling pain and lesser approaches don't work, we go to the total knee replacement. And so it's not one size fits all. We now have... Um, uh, designs on the computer where we can actually match the size ahead of time, but we take an AP, a lateral, and this is an old slide just because it's, you can see it, and you know, now our incisions are smaller, but that's, that's the kneecap uh, over here, this is the femur, and you can see exposed bone here, some exposed bone here, so we open up the knee, and all we're doing is we're not replacing the knee, all we're doing is resurfacing the knee, it's really called an arthroplasty, and we just shave the end of the bad bone and crotch off, how much? about eight millimeters, so it's really not that much. So we take a sliver of the bone off the end of the femur, off the tibia, and what we do is we just, just like capping a tooth, we put caps on the ends of the bone, so instead of the bone rubbing together, the metal and plastic rub together, and these are what the components look like, and they do very well. So when the knee rubs back and forth, no pain, okay? Bilateral, so you'll see a lot of that. If you're pre operating patients and ask for clearance, do a cardiac, you know, a non-stress, or I should say a chemically induced stress test, because these patients are immobile, they're not doing well, and there is some increased risk for patients for bilateral knee replacement. So as part of your practice, you want to you do that. I actually, because I practice at an institution that does a high volume, a lot of times I'll do them staged, but within the same hospital. So I'll do one knee, wait a week, because we have a little um, rehab center there, and then do the second one during the same institution. So the recovery time is really about the same, but it's, it's less morbidity and, and fortunately less mortality for those patients. So people with bilateral disease, you can, you can do them both at the same setting, a little higher risk, one week apart, which not many people do, but I have the advantage of being able to do that, or stage them three to six months apart, which was general. But you straighten up their knees and get them to work. We put them in a CPM machine and get them going because the biggest complication is stiffness, okay? So that's the CPM. Minimally invasive surgery, the patient only sees the outside. So this is one of those buyer beware things, okay? So standard, minimum, believe it or not, it's only about four to five centimeters of difference. You know, it's about two inches of scar. It's really what's inside that counts. So it's not with the outside scar. All scars heal from side to side. That's more of a cosmetic thing. But this is a standard approach to different approaches where we can now go through and take as little muscle as possible. Well, why is that good? Well, we have little instruments that can do that. We go in there and the patients do get better a little bit more quickly. However, at six weeks, no difference. So if I were picking an orthopedic surgeon, I want one who's going to give me a 15, 20 year result. That two or three weeks in the beginning is important. And if you can do it, there's nothing wrong with that. And we certainly do that. But you really want a good approach. And these are just different apparatuses. So instead of that big open knee that you saw before, these are really through, you know, maybe six centimeter incisions. And you can see we can actually put in the knee almost as small as a partial knee replacement. So what's the gold standard? The gold standard for arthritis is still a full knee replacement, but we have less constrained devices and partial knee replacements, but you have to pick the right patient or you'll have a bad result. So in the next just couple of minutes, I'm gonna just talk about hips, very similar. So again, I get to do two joints. So 
The hip's a little bit different. We don't have a lot of the other techniques that we do in the knee. And here's the symptoms. In city onset, it's not usually a traumatic thing. The biggest thing I'm going to tell you is that hip and, and spine go hand in hand. You have to figure out which one. What I do is I sit them down on the table or I lay them on their back and I rotate their hip in and out. If they have pain in their groin area, that's usually from the hip. When I tell patients to point to their hip and it happens all the time, I say, where's your pain? And they go like this. That's not the hip. The hip's in the groin area. So it's a very easy way to figure out if it's trochanteric bursitis on the outside or if it's referred from the pain. But again, we take an x-ray and normal joint. You see the space? No joint. So you can make that diagnosis and we size them up just like before. And all we're going to do is it's basically a femoral component and an acetabular component. And that's what it, just a schematic looks like. You have this little pin going down the femur. Uh, and then the only thing outside of the bone is really this. This is down the intramedullary canal, and then there's a cup. And here's a pre- and post-op where you have sclerosis, uh, subchondral cysts, and now you have a well-placed total hip with a cup, a ball, and a stem. How do we fix them? So again, this is where the technology comes in. So this, this is bone, and now it's very rare to get cemented prostheses. Almost all of the prostheses now are uncemented because it's biologic fixation. So unlike the cement in the old days, that just like the tile in your shower would eventually crack and, and, and chip, it would wear down for a while. So now the cement is replaced by the bone, so the bone actually holds the prosthesis. This is the newer frontier also with bearing surfaces. So that's another thing. You have to individualize to the patient. There's different bearing surfaces. That's the most important thing when you decide to have hip replacement, what you're going to talk about with your orthopedic surgeon. There's ceramic on ceramic, metal on metal, metal on plastic. There's lots of different things. There's no best. If there was a best, we would all use it. So you have to pick the appropriate one. And there's minimally invasive, just like with the knee. So that's the big catchphrase. And there's lots of ways to do it. But unfortunately, the patient only sees what's on the outside. And that's how surgeons are graded. But I can tell you the x-rays and function are the best ways to do it. And there's different approaches. And you'll hear in the news, going from the front, going from the back. Guess what? By six weeks, equivalent. It's really that first initial thing. So make sure you have very direct uh, conversations, you know, but uh, again, most of the time we do a single mini incision. That's kind of the standard uh, where we just make a small incision. We cut less bone, less trauma, um, but by six weeks they're equivalent, but the patients do get better more quickly. What's really helped us particularly at Penn is we've developed these clinical pathways where patients come in and it sounds, seems like a conveyor belt where they're just moving through, but it's very important so we don't miss anything. But this multimodal approach, particularly from anesthesia and pain management, are what we need. But the most important thing is these should be good cases. Complications are what you need to, re, you know, to avoid. So we don't want dislocations. We don't want femoral nerve or sciatic nerve palsies. These cases, I tell the residents, there are cases which should go well unless we screw them up. So we don't want to do anything fancy. Even though it's pen and we're trying to push science, we have to be conservative in the approach that we don't want complications because it's, it's the old physician do no harm. But we want them getting walking out. And then the next day after, after, when I was a resident, we used to keep patients in bed for three days. Now, the day after surgery, we get them up and get them moving. But these are the three, and this is my last slide, the, the questions that they ask you in your office. These are the generic questions. When should I undergo surgery? How long is it going to last? And what's the likelihood of a complication? That's what they're asking. That's what they want to know because they have pain. When should I undergo? When the pain's to the point where it interferes with your activities. We don't operate on x-rays. As a matter of fact, there's been studies to show that x-rays don't correlate with patient function. So when they're getting to the point where they cannot do the things they want to do, they get an operation. One thing I do want to tell you is that once patients are 65, I give them this little speech. Once you're 65, you're as healthy as you're ever going to be. Nobody gets healthier with age. I hope you stay this healthy forever, but nobody gets healthier. Number two, the pain from the arthritis gets worse with time. And number three, one surgery should fix it forever. You shouldn't need another operation in 15 or 20 years. So in my view of life, you're as healthy as you're ever going to be. The pain's going to get worse with time, and one surgery should fix it. You should get an operation. But nobody wants an operation, but that's the, the dividing line. Under age 65 or 60, that's where we have to think about it, because even though we think by testing these things are now going to last 25 or 30 years, we don't know that for sure. You know, we don't have patients who've had these new products, which have only been around for seven to eight years, and we really need to, to stand the test of time. So that's the how long will it last. Generically, we tell patients 95% at 15 years. That's pretty good. However, 
it's it doesn't age like wine or like cheese you know it's it's it it's based on your demand and we know that patients who are 60 walk 40 percent less than age 40 and what's the likelihood of complication that's the best slide believe it or not it's less than one percent but they're the ones that fill up the practices you know so so the good news is a very reproducible thing and again i'm getting time off and thank you very much